I wanted to pick up with the last paragraph that we were working on last time because it helpfully summarizes what we've uh, been considering recent weeks, um, in particular in uh, the last uh, meditation. We talked about the arguments for uh, things like God as the creator of the heavens and the earth and God's providence governing the course of history and time, uh, the, the truth of prophecies, and how God foretold the future uh, many years before things happened, um, and then the performance of various miracles. All these things point to the existence of God, uh, to the veracity of God's word, and to the only way of salvation through Jesus Christ, as all of that supports. So, we've talked about these things, but especially in the context of the unbeliever and how the believer would respond to arguments where we might take the various evidence around us with regard to creation and say, well, look at the human eye and see how that's a tremendously complex system that uh, it's irrational to think that such a complex, mutually integrated system like your eyesight could come about by random acts of chance over extended periods of time. It just is uh, a rather ridiculous notion to, to, to think. <clears throat> and so with illustrations like that and various arguments, we try to persuade the natural man, the man who's committed to his own interpretation of reality, we've tried to persuade him to abandon that point of view and come over to uh, a Christian point of view and the point that Van Til was making is that the, the natural man will take all the data points that you give to him, all the information you give him and reconstitute it, convert it to his own system and then say well you've given me some inf interesting information but none of this proves your point. Uh, it's all illogical from his perspective and so uh, there needs to be a challenge to the human heart and its deep commitments to human autonomy and its uh, assertion that I can explain the world around me on my own terms without reference to God. And so Van Til writes, take now the four points I have mentioned, creation, providence, prophecy, and miracle. Together they represent the whole system of Christian theism. So the different forms of theism we're talking specifically about Christian theism with the, the triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as uh, the heart of this, if you will, system. Together they include what is involved in the idea of God and what He has done round about and for us. <coughs> many times over and in many ways the evidence for all these has been presented, but you have always available an effective answer at hand. Excuse me. Let me read that correctly. But you have an always available and effective answer at hand. It is impossible. It is impossible. Basic to all the objections the average philosopher and scientist raises against the evidence for the existence of God is the assertion or the assumption that to accept such evidence would be to break the rules of logic. So man makes use of his system of logic to refute the existence of God. God does not measure up to the bar of human reasoning and therefore the concept of God can be dismissed. It's contradictory and we talked about the idea of a first cause and how that's dependent on its effect for its nature. In order for a cause to be a cause there must be an effect and if that's to be true of God then he is dependent upon his creation but that's not the kind of God you're speaking about the God you're speaking about is a God who is independent of creation, who is self-contained, to use one of Van Til's favorite terms. God is self-sustaining, ever-blessed, independent. Uh, that God cannot be identified with a God who is the first cause of a series of effects, because that kind of God is dependent upon the effects for his existence. And the God you're arguing for is not that, and therefore there is a logical impossibility that your God exists if you're going to claim that he is the first cause. And so uh, the arguments there begin to break down, and the, the philosopher uses those arguments that 
might have their origin back all the way back to the time of Aristotle. Um, and so um, it's no longer logical uh, to believe that kind of thing. It, it breaks the rule of non-contradiction in, in the form of logic. So um, the point is that the, the secularist, the, the unbeliever, always has something available to explain away the existence of God. He will find some reason to explain away everything you've had. And, and it might be simply that, well, you know, the world is very complex and human learning needs to advance. There are some things we don't understand yet, but with time, science will begin to unlock further mysteries and explain away everything that needs to be explained. And so the faith is that if there are things that are hard to explain, perhaps like eyesight and vision, the thought is that with greater experimentation, greater thought, science e eventually will begin to show how this in fact came about on the basis of an evolutionary process over millions of years. And so uh, faith is faith in science, in human reasoning, in logic, and its ability to explain the world around us without any reference to God. So uh, we'll pick up our, our study at that point. I, I, I so much wanted to hop into one of Van Til's other books and highlight some of the things he has to say there, but I think I'll, for the sake of getting through this one, <laughs> we'll, we'll stick here. Um, so he writes, now, there, excuse me, now before I drill into the nerve of the matter, I must again make apologies. The fact that so many people are placed before a full exposition of the evidence for God's existence and yet do not believe in him has greatly discouraged us who do believe. We have therefore adopted measures of despair. Anxious to win goodwill, we have again compromised our God. Noting the fact that men do not see, we have conceded that what they ought to see is hard to see. In our great concern to win men, we have allowed that the evidence for God's existence is only probably compelling. And from that fatal confession, we have gone one step further down to the point where we have admitted or virtually admitted that it is not really compelling at all. And so we fall back upon testimony instead of argument. After all, we say, God is not found at the end of an argument. He is found in our hearts. So we simply testify to men that once we were dead and now we are alive, that once we were blind and now we see, and give up all intellectual argument. Um, just one more paragraph and I'll make some comments. Do you suppose that our God approves of this attitude of his followers? I do not think so. The God who claims to have made all facts and to have placed his stamp upon them will not grant that there is really some excuse for those who refuse to see. Besides, such a procedure is self-defeating. So let's go back to the previous paragraph here. Um, he again gets into this idea that uh, Christian people have been tempted to uh, make concessions to the natural man in the hopes of winning him over, bringing him to his side. And so uh, the natural man says, this isn't logical, it's not reasonable uh, to believe in God. You, you haven't marshaled sufficient evidence for it, and, and so I can't accept this. And so the Christian is disturbed. W what's the problem? We've presented our reasoning you know, on, on, uh, for an early creation and special creation of mankind in the Garden of Eden and so forth, and yet you seem not to be impressed by that. And so, what do we do? And so, uh, what uh, many Christians have done, have been tempted to do, to do at least, is to say that, well, our arguments show on the basis of the evidence that God is probably there. And if God is probably there, 
then wouldn't you rather make the bet and, and, and give yourself over to God rather than uh, uh, take the chance that he's not there and suffer the consequences of that? After all, if he's not there, you've got nothing to worry about, right? Things will go on whether you are following a religious belief or not. Things will just go on and at the end of time, your, your time, you die and that's the end of your life. But if he is there... And if he is real, then perhaps you really need to think about your relationship to him because he talks about hell and judgment and all these kinds of things. So isn't it not better, since it appears that probably he exists, why not cast yourself onto that just kind of to, to protect yourself from what might yet come? And so we make this argument on probability. And... By doing so, we are adopting the presuppositions of the natural man. And when we do that, it's a fatal mistake for a Christian argument. We adopt his presuppositions, and therefore we'll never, we'll never get out of the box of his worldview. We can try to make our arguments, but we're going to bounce up against, well, it's not logical, it's not logical, it's not persuasive, there are other explanations possible, and so forth. Um, I, I remember taken a philosophy of religion course in uh, at Covenant College, a Christian Presbyterian, actually, conservative Presbyterian college uh, down in Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. It's now Georgia, but at that time it was Tennessee. It didn't move, but they changed the zip code. And <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm sitting in the classroom and the professor is an evidentialist. And he, he prefers amassing evidence and arriving to a conclusion uh, I, which can only be a probable conclusion as the evidence may yet need to be amended as time goes on. And so this Christian philosopher who pitted himself against the uh, rationalist Christian rationalist philosopher Gordon Clark who happened to teach there as well in the same philosophy department, kind of an interesting combination between the two of them. But he argued that um, you know, reasoning based on experience gathers information in an inductive manner. And you just pull this stuff together and you come to a probable conclusion. It's not the, the certainty argument that the, the rationalist will have based on assumed principles and, and going from there. And so... This is, this is the idea that, that uh, you have with a naturalist. Uh, we gather information and we make probable conclusions and we, we grow in our knowledge in that way. You adopt that methodology, you'll never get to the triune God. And Van Til's point uh, will be that this is an offense to God who himself has made the information uh, not only probable but conclusive such that people are without excuse. There's no excuse for saying that there is no God. The evidence was clear and irrefutable in the creation account. You can, we, I can remind you of what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. We're, we're going through this on Wednesdays. Uh, but I'll just highlight verse 20 here. Paul writes, His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So, they are without excuse. So, there, there's no place for a probable argument about whether God exists or not. It's not a matter for probability. There's certainty there. God does exist. The world certainly points to Him. And any uh, description of the world that says, well, I'm not certain of that. It, it, it might say other things. You know, that is a, a sinful response to God's revelation of himself in the world and in nature. And it denies that which God has made very perfectly plain to us, that he exists, that we are accountable to him as our creator. Uh, so, um, th this is Van Til's argument. We don't shift to the, 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 the foundation of the secularist and work from there, we argue from the foundation of the Christian. 
which is the Word of God, the revelation of God, both in nature and in Scripture. This revelation of God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is that which interprets the world around us and is the only explanation of the world around us. Everything else cannot truly account for what we see and experience. Uh, I, I kind of had to chuckle a little bit at the Antilles description here of some of those who say, we fall back upon testimony instead of argument. And, and that's kind of what a lot of evangelicals uh, at, at least end up with. I have had this experience of God. He has changed me. And so I'm new. And uh, he's done that for me. He can do that for you. Why don't you yield your life over to him? And it's not about reasoning, arguing, giving facts that uh, prove conclusively that God exists. It's rather about what I've experienced, and you can have that same experience as well. Um, so uh, Van Til's point is that that is, uh, if you will, to a certain extent, not that the, the experience is not there, but it's not sufficient. It's not fully uh, accounting for what God has revealed authoritatively and clearly in the world around us. Uh, so, let's continue. <clears throat> Van Til writes, Let us see what the modern psychologist of religion, who stands on the same foundation with a philosopher, will do to our testimony. So just a moment ago, we've internalized this idea of God's existence and our relationship to Him. It's my testimony. It's what I've experienced. Therefore, it's true. And you can experience it as well. Well, Van Til said, okay, well, let's take that argument and put it in the test tube here. And we'll go into the, the lab for the modern psychologist of religion. And see what he has to say about this psyche, this experience that we have. And what we'll find is that even that experience can be explained away by the, the secularist, by the unbeliever, so that it, it's not a compelling persuasive argument either. So he, he continues, uh, this psychologist of religion makes a distinction between the raw datum and its cause giving me the raw datum and keeping for himself the explanation of the cause. So the raw datum is the sense experience that we have in the course of life, the various data points of information that uh, circulate in our lives, and we try to marshal them together and say, well, see, there it proves God. And so uh, the psychologists of religion uh, the psychologist of religion will, will say that all these data points are out there, yes, but the data point is different from the cause. And the cause is something of an intellectual imposition on the data points. And you can debate the cause. The data points are there. You might have an experience. I can't question the experience. But the cause of it can be questioned. And if I can question the cause, I can question whether God is in fact the cause of your religious experience or if there isn't something else going on. So he, uh, Van Til continues to speak about Professor James H. Luba, a great psychologist of Bryn Mawr. Uh, <laughs> and he has given a procedure that is typical. Um, let me, uh, I happen to have one of his books uh, I can put up on the screen for you here. Um, I think I can. Okay. And get back here. Bada boom, bada bing. Okay. Um, this, this is his book, The Psychology of Religious Mysticism. Uh, this final, it's about the final chapter. He talks about the, the disappearance of the belief in a personal superhuman cause and the welfare of humanity. And so he talks here about the consequences of what happens if we adopt um, a secular view of all things rather than a re religious view uh, uh, 
uh, of God and so forth. And so here's kind of the uh, development of the book. Uh, I, here's the first few chapters. Mysticism and religion, uh, ecstasy. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, drugs here. You see, talking about alcohol, mezcal, hashish, uh, nitrous oxide, all kinds of things which might infect people and give them some sort of a religious mystical experience. And so you can see he goes through a wide variety of things to explain away Christian theism. Um, talks about various mystics from the past and so forth and, and what their experience was. But um, uh, he, he's just one example of this kind of thing where uh, the religious experience of the Christian may be questioned uh, from the point of view of the psychologist of religion. So we'll get back to Van Til here and uh, see his uh, analysis of Professor Luba's point of view. <coughs> he says, the reality of any given datum of an immediate experience in the sense in which the term is used here may not be impugned. When I feel cold or warm, sad or gay, that's not homosexual, but happy. <laughs> this is back in the 1920s when he, he's writing here. Um, discouraged or confident, I am cold, sad, discouraged, etc. And every argument which might be advanced to prove to me that I am not cold is, in the nature of the case, preposterous. An immediate experience may not be controverted. It cannot be wrong. End quote. And Van Til comments on this. He says, all this seems on the surface to be very encouraging. Um, and to use this analogy that Van Til has of an immigrant coming into the world of the, the secular uh, worldview, the immigrant, I think, being the Christian trying to uh, speak to the secularist, uh, he, he continues, uh, the immigrant is hopeful of a ready and speedy admittance. However, Ellis Island must still be passed. Ellis Island is kind of a, a, a metaphor for uh, uh, human autonomy and uh, human reasoning, logic, to explain all things. If this immigrant from the Christian worldview comes into the, the worldview of the secularist, well, in order for him to be persuasive to the secularist, he must go through the Ellis Island of human autonomy and logic and reasoning and accept those things as a foundation. It's like the, the constitution for living in this naturalistic nation. Um, by the way, I'm kind of amused at the story in the news recently of uh, somebody who uh, uh, pulled the wool over the eyes of the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, by persuading them to become a sister city for a, a, a nation that doesn't exist. <laughs> it's uh, Klesia or something like that is the name of the, the, the country. Uh, I forget the exact name of it, Klesia. And uh, they're supposed to have their own laws and, and they have a leader who is a descendant of the Hindu gods and, and, and this kind of thing. And the, the, the city of Newark bought the whole thing and became a, a sister city to this entirely imaginary world. And uh, when it was discovered that there was actually no physical place called Casia or whatever it is uh, in, in either in Latin America or, or wherever it's supposed to be, um, and, and I think it was in Latin America, and the question is why is it there a Hindu colony in Latin America? <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, people began to, to, to discover this, and then they asked the, the representatives of this nation, <laughs> is this a real place? And, and they responded by saying, yes, it's a real place. It doesn't have borders. It doesn't have land mass like you have, but it's a real place. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's a beautiful thing that they're doing here. It's just like those who say, well, I'm a man, but I'm self-identifying as a woman. <laughs> or I'm white, but I identify myself as black, as that woman years, some years ago, Dolia, I think was her last name, who went around advocating uh, black rights and pretending to be a black person herself, and she, <laughs> there's no black part of her at all, but she identified herself as black. 
Dolezal. Okay, thank Dolezal. you. Yeah. Uh, so that's what they're doing with, with this nation. You know, and what can the globalists say who argues for no borders and uh, being a world citizen, what can they say to refute the man? It's all in his mind, it's imaginary, but they can't really say that it's wrong on their presuppositions, their assumptions. So, welcome to the world. Anyway, getting back to the argument here. Um, the the uh, Christian who is an immigrant into this, if you will, this imaginary world, this Cassia world of the secularist, it's all imaginary, it's all in his head, which he's uh, embraced. Uh, the only substance to it is where uh, he has borrowed, to use Van Til's, one of Van Til's favorite images, he uses borrowed capital from the Christian worldview and uses that surreptitiously to support his own point of view, but then dismisses the, the God of the Christian theism that, that is the, the source and cause of everything. But anyway, for the Christian immigrant to go into this world, he must, uh, to be accepted, adopt the constitution of that world through Ellis, the Ellis Island of human autonomy, logic and reasoning, and so forth. And so, he quotes uh, uh, Luba further by, uh, by saying, But if the raw data of experience are not subject to criticism, the causes ascribed to them are. If I say that my feeling of cold is due to an open window, or my state of exaltation to a drug, or my renewed, knowledge, my renewed courage to God, my affirmation goes beyond my immediate experience. I have ascribed a cause to it, and that cause may be right, may be the right or the wrong one. So you have your experience, your data, or what have you. That's not controverted, but the reasoning that goes underneath that, the reasoning that interprets that for you, can be challenged. And you say that the cause is God, I say that the cause is something else. You say you're cold. Well, you say the reason is because the window is open, and I say the reason is because you got the air conditioning turned up. Different reasons, but the same experience. I'm not questioning whether you're cold. I'm questioning whether you're cold because of the open window or because of God or because of the air conditioning or human science. So uh, here, here's the challenge for us. And thus the immigrant, uh, the, the Christian evangelist, must wait at Ellis Island a million years. That is to say, I as a believer in God through Christ assert that I am born again through the Holy Spirit. That's my datum. That's my experience that I'm uh, speaking about. The psychologist says, that is a raw datum of experience and as such, incontrovertible. Well, it sounds like, okay, we've won our case, right? No. He says, we do not deny it, he says, but it means nothing to us. That's the point. It means nothing to us. If you want it to mean something to us, you must ascribe a cause to your experience. We shall then examine the cause. Was your experience caused by opium or God? You say by God. Well, say these psychologists, that is impossible since philosophy has shown that it is logically contradictory to believe in God. Okay, back to that old argument. The first cause being dependent upon its effect. It's illogical. It's contradictory. You may come back at any time when you have changed your mind about the cause of your regeneration. We shall be glad to have you and welcome you as a citizen of our realm if only you take out your naturalization papers. And so the, the believer with his experience is not going to be persuasive to the unbeliever because 
it doesn't fit in with his interpretation of reality. You need the naturalization papers of naturalism, of explaining the world on the basis of human autonomy, in order to uh, accept that uh, for your, to be acceptable in this world. So, uh, Van Til continues, If I have offended you, it, is, it has been because I dare not, even in the midst of winning you, offend my God. And if I have not offended you, I have not spoken of my God. For what you have really done in your handling of the evidence for belief in God is to set yourself up as God. You have made the reach of your intellect the standard of what is possible or not possible. You have thereby virtually determined that you intend never to meet a fact that points to God. Facts, to be facts at all, facts that is with decent scientific and philosophic standing, must have your stamp instead of that of God upon them as their virtual creator. Note that point. The, the naturalist, the secularist, the, the, the pagan, in the end, sets himself up as the final authority, and therefore as God. Everything must submit to the bar of human reasoning. What we think is true and right. What causes we think are appropriate to assign to a particular experience. And we reject out of hand the experience or the cause of God. That does not explain the experience. You have an experience, we're not challenging that, but we're saying there are other ways to explain that experience. It might be drugs, it might be religious enthusiasm, some sort of uh, uh, demagogue that's come over you and persuaded you of things and you got caught up in uh, an emotional kind of experience these kinds of things but it's not God because God does not exist our philosophy has shown that has demonstrated that and so uh, the, the, the pagan has set himself up as God and be reminded here Van Til says if we are faithfully arguing from a Christian point of view, to this the pagan, natural, secular man, we will offend them because we are challenging their, their unbelief, their whole system of thought. Everything must be repented of. They are in rebellion against their Creator and they must repent and be reconciled to their God. And this is an offense to them. Um, you're telling them that they're wrong, abysmally wrong, and facing divine judgment for the error of their ways, and that is offensive. I think we as Christians need to embrace that and not be frightened by that, not be intimidated by the fact that when we give testimony to God, the unbeliever is going to respond with hostility, with being offended. Uh, with perhaps emotional uh, responses and even personal attacks against us for what we believe and say. Um, that's part of the, the, the conflict that exists in our world between the Spirit of God and the Spirit of darkness, between Christ and Antichrist, between the Kingdom of God and the Kingdom of Satan. There are flashpoints at every point along the way. At every point where they, they meet, there's a, a flash. And uh, so, personally, we need to understand that going in, be prepared mentally, if you will, psychologically, by faith uh, in, in that regard, and not be overwhelmed by that or intimidated by that. As Paul said to Timothy, we've not been given a spirit of fear, uh, but a, a spirit of... Uh, <coughs> Now let me get the language. Power, 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 love, power, love, power love, love, and a strong mind. mind. Yeah, I, I forgot the first. Mm. So, uh, this is what has been given to us in Christ, and so we need to be prepared to uh, stand before the world on the sure foundation of God's Word. Continuing, times 9.59.
Of course, I realize full well that you do not pretend to create redwood trees and elephants, but you do virtually assert that redwood trees and elephants cannot be created by God. You've heard of the man who never wanted to see or be a purple cow. I've not heard that uh, before, but okay. Well, you have virtually determined that you never will see or be a created fact. With Sir Arthur Eddington, you say, as it were, what my net can't catch isn't fish. Nor do I pretend, of course, that once you have been brought face to face with this condition, you can change your attitude. No more than the Ethiopian can change his skin or the leopard his spots can you change your attitude. You have cemented your colored glasses to your face so firmly that you cannot take them off even when you sleep. Freud has not even had has not had even a glimpse of the sinfulness of sin as it controls the human heart. Only the great physician, through his blood atonement on the cross, and by the gift of his spirit, can take those colored glasses off and make you see facts as they are, facts as evidence, as inherently compelling evidence for the existence of God. So, um, the, the, the naturalist man is the god of his own system and while he doesn't create the cows and the birds and the trees and so forth as the god of Christianity does he's the one who identifies them as, as being there and he interprets them accordingly and any other interpretation that says God is the reason for these things must be rejected and explained out of hand and Van Til makes the point that my reasoning with you is not going to persuade you otherwise. I can present to you God-interpreted facts as they truly are. And yet you will not be persuaded by them because your heart is corrupted, enslaved to sin. Um, and uh, just to launch over here to Van Til's book on apologetics, um, he, he makes the point here that there's been a disturbance in human nature. Uh, to, and I'll highlight here this yellow statement. To the extent that man consists of intellect, he does not and cannot sin. That's the idea okay, presented by Rome, that man in his mind, is, his intellect, is capable of reasoning faithfully and truly. And if you uh, take him... Along in those arguments, you can lead him to God. Well, there's, the problem is that his intellect is corrupted. It's polluted. It's enslaved to his worldview. And so he's not going to be reasoned with and argued into the kingdom. You can't just show him facts and lead him in. Uh, he will constantly reinterpret them according to his own assumptions and worldview. And... Uh, so th that's kind of where we stand with that. Let me try to make a little bit more progress, and I guess we're going to have to finish up shortly. We're not, not going to finish this up today. Um, you may reply to this, excuse me, uh, not far enough back. It ought to be pretty plain now what sort of God I believe in. It is God the all-conditioner. It is the God who created all things, who, by his providence, conditioned my youth, making me believe in him, and who, in my later life, by his grace, still makes me want to believe in him. It is the God who also controlled your youth, and so far has apparently not given you his grace, that you might believe in him. Every fact in the world is a fact which is conditioned by God, qualified by God, interpreted by God. It has its meaning in view of God's interpretation of that fact. It can only truly be understood as a fact created by the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The scientist rebels against that. The secular scientist rebels against that. There is a Christian science based on God's Word that seeks to interpret reality, but the secular scientist rejects 
the interpretation, the qualification, the conditioning. He rejects all that and tries to reinterpret it based on human autonomy, human reasoning. And, the, and that helps to give him an excuse for saying there is no God, I'm not accountable to him, there is no life after death, there is no hell to come for me because of my, of my rebellion and so forth. I can live out my life here and drift into oblivion as we saw from the poet last week. So, um, a Christian worldview is that God is the all conditioner and all facts are God created facts and that's the only way to understand them. You may reply to this then, what's the use of arguing and reasoning with me? Well, there is a great deal of use in it. You see, if you are really a creature of God, you are always accessible to Him. When Lazarus was in the tomb, he was still accessible to Christ who called him back to life. It is this on which true preachers depend. The prodigal thought he had clean escaped from the father's influence. In reality, the father controlled the far country to which the prodigal had gone. So it is in reasoning. True reasoning about God is such as stands upon God as upon the emplacement or foundation that alone gives meaning to any sort of human argument. And such reasoning, we have a right to expect, will be used of God to break down the one-horse chase of human autonomy. I'll just read one more and finish here. Deep down in your heart, you know very well that what I have said is true. You know there is no unity in your life. You want no God who by his counsel provides for the unity you need. Such a God, you say, would allow for nothing new. So you provide your own unity. But this unity must, by your own definition, not kill that which is wholly new. That really means that it must stand over against the wholly new and never touch it at all. By your logic, you talk about possibles and impossibles, but all this talk is in the air. It can never have anything to do with reality. It's the kingdom of Cassia. Your logic claims to deal with eternal and changeless matters. And your facts are wholly changing things. And never the twain shall meet. So you have made nonsense of your own experience. Logic is an eternal principles, things that cannot change. It's true in all cases. Well, it's being applied to things which are subject to change. Consequently, they really never intersect with each other because human experience is constantly changing and the laws of logic don't change and there's just a gap there. And so, Van Til argues for the fact that God must come into the heart and change the heart in order for this person to see and to believe. And except God does that, uh, breaking down the one horse chase of human autonomy, unless God does that, this man will continue in his worldview. And so why do we go out and try to reason with others on, on the foundation of Christian truths? Well, God may be pleased to use that to change the heart of that individual. We don't know what God will do. So we are either bearing witness to an unbeliever who is not among God's elect, who will indeed perish and reject everything we have to say, because he himself wants to and prefers, from his own heart, prefers to live in his world of imaginary autonomy, either you'll get that response or God will indeed work in the heart of the individual and bring them to faith in Jesus Christ, see, you know, having their eyes open to see that all facts are God created facts, that God is the Lord of all, and that in fact Jesus is the way of salvation from sin and death and the hope of eternal life. And so there must be that uh, fundamental change in the heart of the unbeliever in order for him to see the whole counsel of God. We are still uh, as believers accountable and encouraged to reason with the unbeliever. 
We don't know who among the unbelieving multitudes are among God's elect. But if God gives us the opportunity to share that gospel, then it's quite possible that God will, in fact, work through that in his own way, in his own time, to bring that person to a saving knowledge of Christ. And it's God's purpose and his will that we should do so, that we should go trusting that God has a people that he intends to save. Today is a day of salvation. Somewhere around the world today, God is saving his elect people, bringing them to himself. And it may be that today, what you have to say to a friend or a neighbor will be the reason why that person comes into the kingdom of God. And so therefore, do not be discouraged from uh, sharing the gospel and a, a, a God-centered world with the world around you. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll pick up this next time and give you an opportunity to react uh, at this point. Okay. Fantastic study. Really, really good. I, I wonder also if uh, in the example of Pharaoh or the men in Sodom, if if there's it's an unbeliever and they don't want to hear what we have to say, maybe it could be for the cause of God's glory. Uh, uh, they didn't heed my my word, and they were destroyed. Uh, I, I, I always think about Pharaoh's heart being hardened, and how God said, "You know, I will get the glory." As he just one thing after the other destroyed the Egyptians. If, if, for those hard cases, yeah. That's a great. Uh, illustration of the point we're making. Here's Pharaoh in Egypt, and he has no one less than Moses, the great prophet of God, standing before him, telling him, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. If you don't let them go, I will send all these plagues. And Pharaoh doesn't believe him. He interprets everything Moses says from his own worldview, from his own autonomy. He says, Moses, you just want the people to get out you know, and escape and do what they want to do. Uh, and so uh, Pharaoh, having Moses in front of him, having God act in history and time in miraculous ways to bring judgments on Egypt, and yet Pharaoh is not persuaded. He will not yield over to God and acknowledge that the Lord alone is God and he is his creature and he must serve him. Pharaoh will not do that in spite of the tremendous evidence standing right there in front of him. So, here's you know, what, what Paul brings up in Romans chapter 9. Um, the, the, the natural man is hostile to God, both uh, emotionally with his will and his feelings, but also intellectually he is hostile to God. Sin has corrupted his intellect as well as, as his will and his emotions and feelings. And therefore, everything within him, his whole heart, his whole being, is opposed to God, resists God, will not respond to God, will instead cling to his own worldview, even if it means his own destruction, even if it means him going into the, the divided Red Sea that God himself has divided for the sake of his people, going in there to attack the people of God, to attack the God of the, of the Israelites and nonetheless be destroyed. Uh, he will not repent. Except God has compassion on some, they will not be saved. No amount of reasoning will, will, will lead them into the kingdom of God, ultimately. We do reason with people, we plead with the, them, we make use of emotional arguments, we command people to repent, appeal to the will, we reason with them, from the world of experience, but in the end, we preach the word of God to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, I I think of my experience as a, a pastor preaching, and we don't have a lot of visitors come into the church, but occasionally we, we'll have some folks come in, and I don't know a whole lot about what's going on in their hearts and minds, obviously, but they'll come in. I'll preach what I think is a, a very good sermon based on the word of God. And that's the last time we see them. <laughs> they say, uh, well, very good sermon. We'll come, we'll come back next week. And 
Never <laughs> see them again. Poof, they're gone. <laughs> uh, and and I've had, like, I think, too, of the funeral service I gave for Larry Handy's family. And Rick was there for that, Rick and, and Lois, and there were, I don't know, 60, 70 people in, in that, At least. something like that, uh, gathered there from Roman Catholic backgrounds, no doubt, and other kinds of backgrounds, who knows. And I thought I preached a, a, a faithful Ooh, an excellent stem, message. message to them uh, about the gospel. Of course, I'm biased, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we share the same point of view. <laughs> um, but... We did not get one person. I did not get a response from anyone other than you know, immediate family members saying that was a good sermon. But even so, none of them come to, well, I, I guess maybe, I don't know if they came to our church for a time or so after that or not, but really not, nobody came to us. No, so, no. so it's well, like, I haven't seen Larry's family since or anybody yeah, else right. from there, except Lois and me and you. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's like the, the sower who sows his seed, as the Jesus told the parable. And you cast the seed out, and some falls on good ground, and there's a good response, and uh, other seed falls in different places, and all kinds of reasons why people reject repentance and faith in Christ and so forth. So. Yeah. I couldn't help but remember during a study about experience several years ago uh, I had a co-worker who was a very avowed atheist and we got to work together for a few days and I was just so thankful that finally somebody I could talk to at least have a have a discussion about spiritual things and instead of the re regular inane nonsense but it was just it was so good to, to work with someone who was willing to talk about things but anyway some of the some of the points he made were were exactly what we were talking about. He said, all, all the things we believe in, uh, the, the creation, the resurrection, the the Christ's miracles, he called them magic. It was all it was all magic. Yeah. And I said, wow, that's like Jesus saying, well, the Pharisees say he casts out demons by Beelzebub, you know, yeah. and, and so and. Anyway, after a couple of days of and off and on discussions, we came to the conclusion that it was, quote, you know, a matter of faith. I said, well, yeah, of faith in what? Oh, well, here we go again. We'll start. <laughs> <laughs> it starts up again. So, yeah. so, and and it was definitely, oh, we just couldn't go any further. It was just now up to the Lord to either save or not save yeah. at, the, at that time. Um, we, so he, he knew where we were coming from, and uh, and um, we know where he's coming from. So it's just, it, t it takes the Spirit of God to regenerate a person. It's hard. So that's what it comes down to. I mean, I think Van Til took a long time to get there, but <laughs> it's, but but that's what it came down to, what you were saying at the end. It's, it's, it, it's a matter of the regeneration by the Holy Spirit and we, we throw it out there uh, and Lord willing it'll have an impact on someone by God's grace so, yeah but it's all magic <laughs> that's a common explanation for the miracles of Jesus for example that it was a magic act and, and that fits in with um, the random chance environment in which the naturalist operates. There's no God-imposed mm -hmm. order on things, and so the world is governed by random chance events. And we try to impose our reasoning on what, what's there, and contradictory to random chance, we impose order or see order there. <laughs> kind of, uh, all right. But there, there's always that fallback. Well, there, there's a chance that certain things can occur. Um, there may be powers at work in the earth that w we don't understand that science has yet to explain. Uh, but you know, the, the, the naturalist is, in his mind, constantly pushing back the frontiers of chaos at, with human knowledge. And it will get so far, and on the other side is chaos, uh, random, randomness. And uh, in the end, anything that he can't explain goes into the basket of chance, uh, a random event, 
mystical forces, uh, things like that, but can't be God. Yeah. He also adds years. Like, if you can't explain it, then make yeah. it 300 million years yeah. ago. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a million, a million years is a long time. So the difference, why isn't it 299 million years? You say, you throw out this arbitrary number, 300 million years, yeah. why not 299? Because a lot could happen in a million years. It, the, the fact is, they just don't know. They can't explain it. They're just throwing a number right. out there. Right. It's, and, and people say, oh, yeah, that's possible. Yeah, it was 300 million years ago. Anything could have happened in that time. It's, it's, Talk about lack of logic. I mean, it's just to throw a number out there. Yeah. That, that'll be that'll be the answer. Yeah, that's they use that excuse for evolution, right? You know, right. Of course, you know we don't see any forms changing <laughs> and, and everything. And they tell us, oh yeah, all these things change from amoebas to whatever, ever monkeys to people and whatever. Well, where is it? There's no, no evidence of that. Three hundred million years. Yeah. Three hundred million years. Wow. Well, what's what? Are we in a a, a half time or something? <laughs> Is this intermission? <laughs> Is that what we're in right now? Because there's nothing going on right now. <laughs> you know, my my wife and I uh, were just watching a series, a short four part series. We just watched the first part. And it starts out with the flood and the days of Noah. And it pointed out the conditions at the time that the vegetation was so lush over all the earth that you could, uh, couldn't believe how you could pick uh, uh, fruit from the trees. Everything was growing, growing, growing. And, of course, he pointed out that, uh, you know, the people just ignored uh, the calls of Noah to repent and turn to, to God. And they ignored it and ignored it and ignored it. Finally, uh, he, he, the animals got on, his family got on, and the door was closed. Then the storm started. But apparently, the way it seems to me is that God made it so turbulent. He ripped up everything from the earth, all the vegetation, all the everything and made a great big soup pile out of it and then when it settled in layers you could find now you could find a broad layer almost throughout the earth of coal and seams and uh, the fish and whatnot were fully formed were in one section and others were in another section just as you know when you have different elements they fall out as to the uh, order the weight specific gravity whatever of the thing and you look at and he pointed out you know uh, 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 at the Grand Canyon how all these layers are supposed to be millions and millions and millions and what he's saying is that it wasn't millions and millions and millions. It could have been overnight. Yeah. Mm. Because when St. Helena's blew and, and blew out a section of uh, the lake that had been forming, it formed layers and layers and layers of different strata as everything was all churned up. And that you know, that's the explanation for a long, long time. And of course... The Bible points out in the day, like in the days of Noah at the end time, it will be like that, where people will be doing all this stuff, good, evil, evil, good. And what are we watching? We're watching insaneness. Uh, you know, <laughs> they, who, what? I mean, plurals for a person. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll watch, uh, and it was on Prime, and I'm trying to figure out, uh, you know, I forget the names of things, unfortunately, but it, it was done by a ministry, and they did a very good job of pointing all the, and, and in an hour and 20 minutes, pointed all this stuff out about, you know, it really didn't take millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years to lay down all of the structure. It could have been, bang. God churned up the earth, 
you know, it said that the earth opened up and... 40 days and 40 nights. It was just the rain, but opening up the earth and churning everything out. And uh, the way it fell out was in layers and layers and layers and layers. <laughs> and uh, that's his point. That it was everything that was found was found fully formed. No half baked fish with food in its mouth, yeah. etc. Uh, so I think it was a good series. And I'll, I'll try to get the name of it. Um, I think it was done in 2019, so it's not I saw the one on Mount St. Helen. I saw there was a whole, a whole uh, documentary about that. Right. It was a huge gorge that was wiped out in one day. Right. And they said it would have taken millions of years for like a stream. Of <laughs> yeah, right. It was only 100 feet high, but it but was layered just, just like uh, the Grand Canyon. One day. The other, the other thing with the evolutionists, there is such defiance. I was watching a documentary where they said the turkeys are are are, are the uh, are evolved from Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> so here I am watching these little T Rexes running around. <laughs> there, there is such defiance that they're that they're they're so bizarre. It reminds me of the the magicians that Pharaoh had. He could they they kept up for a short while with with the the, the power that God was giving Moses. That of course all those snakes were eaten up by Moses's cane, and then, <laughs> and then of course no, no, none of, the, none of them could raise anybody from the dead. So they, yeah. they're they're, they're one magic. Point they had to say, "Oh, this is the finger of God." Yeah, there's, there's, there, it was their their magic was proven false, and even the demons were proven thrown out. Mm. Mm. So. I think the magic is that they don't repent when they see what all the wrongs in the world. You know, I, that's another part part of the. Well, G Jesus said that even if someone were raised from the dead, people won't believe. believe. So we have to keep that in mind. Remember, and he told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, a rich man wanted uh, wanted God to send back our father Abraham to send people to his brothers, <laughs> and that's where that quotation is. That if, even if someone raises from the dead, they won't believe. Mm. Yeah. The Jews kept saying, "Give us more miracles! Give us more miracles!" Sure. Right. Right. <laughs> Oh, there goes my Signs and Wonders conference I wanted to hold next weekend. <laughs> <laughs>